Hello everyone. Let's analyze. So in the last lecture we talked about the convergence of function sequences and function series. Today we're going to talk about a few tests for determining when a function series converges and the integrability and differentiability of convergent function sequences and series. We're going to begin with the Cauchy criteria for uniform convergence. Well, one of the main results of real analysis one is that if a sequence of numbers converges then it is Cauchy and if a sequence of numbers is Cauchy then it is also convergent. Well similarly we can say the same thing about uniformly convergent functions. If a sequence of functions converges uniformly then we can actually describe that convergence using the Cauchy criteria. That is rather than describing it as getting arbitrarily close to a limit function, I can describe it as the sequence of functions getting arbitrarily close to each other. And in fact, if we take the proof of that result from real analysis one, that convergence of a sequence of numbers is equivalent to Cauchy convergence, and apply it to functions for all x, would actually get the proof of this. So we'll leave that as an exercise to the reader. But we will use it to prove our test for series convergence. This one is known as the Weierstrass M test. Suppose Fn maps A to R as a sequence of functions that satisfies these two bullet points. For each n, Fn of x is a bounded function and the bound is mn. Suppose also that the series mn converges, which is a numerical series, not a function series. Suppose that converges. Well, if the two bullet points are true, then the function series converges uniformly and also absolutely. So let's prove the result. Notice the second bullet says that the series mk converges for k equals 1 to infinity. Well, that's equivalent to saying that the partial sum sequence converges, where the partial sum is just the sum from k equals 1 to n of mk, right? and sn converges. And this is just a sequence of numbers. Let's put our sequence brackets on it. Right, it's a sequence of numbers. Therefore, this sequence, right, for n equals 1 to infinity, is Cauchy. We recall the definition of Cauchy for a sequence of numbers. For any epsilon greater than zero, there exists a natural number n such that little m little n greater than or equal to big N implies that Sn minus Sm is less than epsilon. Well, what is this equal to? Sn minus Sm is equal to the sum from k equals 1 to n mk minus the sum from k equals 1 to m, mk. And let's suppose, without any loss of generality, that n is greater than m. Of course, one of them has to be bigger. If they're the same, the difference would just be 0. So let's just suppose that n is larger. We would get m, m, 
m, m plus 1, all the way through m, n. Right, because this is summing all the terms from k equals 1 to n, and this is subtracting the first m terms. Actually, if I'm subtracting the first m terms, this one actually goes away. So it's just these. And that is less than epsilon, because this is equal to the difference of partial sums, which satisfies the Cauchy criteria. Now, our goal okay, is to prove that this is uniformly convergent. Well, we're going to do that by showing that, right? So we want to show that this satisfies. the Cauchy criteria. And perhaps you can see where we're going. Now when I say this satisfies the Cauchy criteria, if we look back at the Cauchy criteria, you might say, wait a second, Cauchy criteria is talking about a sequence of functions. But we're talking about a series of functions. But remember, a series of functions is just a sequence of functions in disguise. In particular, the sequence of partial sums. That is, show Sn of x, which is the partial sum satisfies the Cauchy criteria. Well, for all x in my domain, according to the first bullet of our assumption, of our hypothesis, that is for each n, there is an upper bound for fn of x for every x in the domain. All right. So we've already shown what the second bullet implies, and we're going to use that fact. Now let's put into play the first bullet. S n of x minus S m of x is equal to the sum f m plus 1 of x plus f n of x Right, hidden in the dot 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 is fm plus 2, fm plus 3, all the way through fn. The triangle inequality says this is less than or equal to the absolute value of each one. And using the first bullet, this is less than or equal to m, m plus 1, plus m, m plus 2, all the way through m, n, which, as we've already pointed out, is less than epsilon. Because for all x, my partial sum satisfies the Cauchy criteria, my partial sum is uniformly convergent. Because my partial sum is uniformly convergent, my series is uniformly convergent. Now, of course, you might be asking, well, wait a second, what about the absolute part? Well, a series is absolutely convergent if the series of the absolute value of the functions is uniformly convergent. And it is because the difference of those partial sums would be exactly this, which we can show is still bounded by epsilon. So let's deploy 
our Weierstrass M test in an example. Let a k, k equals one to infinity, be a bounded sequence. We are going to show, using the Weierstrass M test, that this series converges to a continuous function. on the entire row line. Now, in fact, we're actually going to show that it converges uniformly. Now, if I consider every partial sum, I have myself a polynomial, right? That is a scaled sum of integer powers of x. So that's a polynomial. And of course, polynomials are continuous, so my partial sums are continuous, and if they converge uniformly, then the function it converges to must be a continuous function. That's something that we proved in the last lecture. So we'll get the continuous function part essentially for free. Well, let alpha be a positive number. We're going to first show that my series is uniformly convergent on the closed interval negative alpha to alpha. The fact that the sequence AK is bounded implies that AK is less than or equal to some number, let's call big A, for every natural number K. And also zero. This is a sequence that goes from zero to infinity. Of course, some people like to include zero in their definition of the natural numbers. I don't like to include zero. It's really a personal preference. Then, right, my functions that are being summed I have to show that they're bounded for all x. Well, this is less than or equal to a times x to the k over k factorial. And here, x to the k is defined on the interval negative alpha to alpha. So then this is less than or equal to a times alpha k divided by k factorial. So then let us define that as our mk and determine whether mk satisfies the m test. Well, the series mk for k equals 0 to infinity is a alpha to the k over k factorial from k equals equal zero to infinity. I can factor out the a and hopefully what 
we see here is essentially the evaluation of the Taylor expansion of the exponential function centered at zero. That is, my function, or my series rather, my series converged. Because this converged, an nk is an upper bound of each function in my series my series converges. Furthermore, according to the Weierstrass M test, it converges uniformly. whatever function it converges to is continuous because every partial sum is a polynomial. which is continuous. And we've proven our result. There are other tests for determining when a function series is convergent. A couple of them are Abel's test and Dirichlet's test. We don't have time to get too deep into them but for the sake of complete, completeness, I'll present them to you, uh, but further than that, we won't get into it. If phi n is a decreasing sequence of functions with a common bound, in other words, there's some number n that is a bound for every function in my sequence, then if this series converges uniformly, so does this one. In addition to Abel's test, there's also Dirichlet's test, which says that if Fn is a sequence of functions, and every partial sum is bounded for all n, so every partial sum has a common bound, then if gn is a sequence of decreasing non-negative functions, then the series fn of x times gn of x converges uniformly. So our next theorem is on the integrability of a sequence of functions when they converge. Suppose that fn is a sequence of Riemann integrable functions and that they converge uniformly to f. Then we conclude we can conclude that f is integrable and that the integral of f of x is equal to the limit of the integral of fn of x. Let's prove this result. Suppose f is integrable. Now of course that's one of the results. It's kind of like cheating to suppose that it's integrable. However, we're going to prove that this is equal to this if this is actually a number that exists and then we'll prove that it's a number that exists. So we'll just do the proof a little bit out of order. So let's suppose that f is integrable.
and let epsilon be positive. Right? Because we're going to prove that a sequence converges to a limit. Right? We have the limit as n goes to infinity of this. This, for every n, is a number. Right? The definite integral of a function from a to b is a number. And this number is indexed by n. So we just have a sequence of numbers. And I claim that this sequence of numbers has a limit and that the limit is this, which I'm supposing exists. So to show that this is true, let epsilon be greater than zero. Since fn converges to f uniformly, I know that there exists a natural number n such that if n is greater than or equal to n, then fn of x minus f of x is less than epsilon divided by b minus a for all x in my domain, which is the closed interval a to b. Right? The fact that the same n gives me my arbitrary closeness result for every x is exactly the uniform convergence criteria. Of course, I want to show that the absolute value of this minus this is less than epsilon when n is large enough. this, well, that equals, since I have a common domain, fn of x minus f of x, or I suppose I should add my dx to be proper, using my triangle inequality for integrals, this is less than or equal to, The, the integral, or less than or equal to the integral of the absolute value of the integrand. Which, by the way, so long as this is true, my integrand is less than epsilon over b minus a. And of course, that just equals epsilon over b minus a times b minus a, which is just equal to epsilon. Since epsilon is greater than zero is arbitrary, and the fact that when n is greater than or equal to this n that exists implies that this difference is less than epsilon then I've satisfied the definition of convergence for this sequence of numbers to this limit. Of course, assuming that this limit is actually a number. We'll prove that it's a number right now. So the second part prove that this number exists, at least as Riemann defines this process. As before, since fn converges to f uniformly, there exists a natural number n for which fn of x minus f of x is less than epsilon divided by 2 times b minus a for all x in my domain. We also know 
that fn is Riemann integrable. implying that there exists a partition P of AB for which the upper sum of Fn over P minus the lower sum is less than epsilon over 2. Well, let's consider the upper sum of f over the same partition. That's the sum from k equals 0 to n minus 1 of the supremum of f from xk to xk plus 1. times delta xk. Now, remember that f is within epsilon over 2 times b minus a of fn. Therefore, the supremum of f must be within this radius of the supremum of fn. And it's true for all x, so certainly it's true for all x in this partition. F n over the same partition plus epsilon times delta x k from k equals 0 to n minus 1. Well, in fact, this is just equal to the upper sum of F n over the partition P plus, I'm sorry, this is epsilon over 2 times B minus A. So plus epsilon over 2 times B minus A times B minus A. Similarly, the lower sum of fn comma p minus epsilon divided by 2b minus a times b minus a and these cancel is less than or equal to the lower sum of f over the same partition for the exact same reasoning. Therefore the upper sum of f comma p minus the lower sum of f comma p is less than or equal to well this term we have an upper bound fn comma p plus epsilon over 2 minus this term this is the positive is bounded below by this, so the negative is bounded above by the negative of this, minus L Fn comma P plus epsilon over 2. Uh, now this epsilon over 2 plus this epsilon over 2 makes a full epsilon, and we already know that this difference is less than epsilon over 2. That gives us 3 halves of epsilon. Now because epsilon is arbitrary, it's fine, but it's not as pretty as I would like. So let's just square this two. Square this two. Square that two. And square that two. I can square all those twos because the uniform convergence criteria means I can make this as small as I'd like. So I can square the two. 
with uniform convergence comes great power, specifically a power of 2. So this difference, as we mentioned, is less than epsilon over 2. So this is less than epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 4. That's this difference. That's less than epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 4, which equals epsilon. So what have we showed? For an arbitrary epsilon, so I should probably state here, let epsilon be arbitrary and positive. There exists a partition for which the difference of the upper sum and the lower sum of f is less than epsilon. Because epsilon can be made to be arbitrarily small, the supremum of u for all partitions, sorry, the infimum of u for all partitions, minus the supremum of l for all partitions must be zero if their difference can be made arbitrarily small. And now we've shown that f, the uniform limit, is in fact integrable. So I have a question. Did we need uniform convergence in previous theorem? Could we have proven our result if we just had pointwise convergence? Would that be enough? Well, let's consider an example. Let's consider the example Fn maps the closed interval 0 to 1 to R, and we'll define it piecewise, and I'll define it by just drawing a picture for a particular n. So suppose that it's defined one way from 0 to 1 over 2n, another way from 1 over 2n to 1 over n, and from here to here is in fact 0. But from here to here is what is often called a hat function because it looks like a hat that you would wear if you were in trouble or if it was your birthday. Now, hopefully we can see that as n goes to infinity, the interval for which the function is not zero gets increasingly small, arbitrarily small in fact meaning that the function fn converges to zero. However, for all n, for every single n, there is a value, x, in fact, this one here, that is not zero. In fact, it gets further away from zero, the smaller n gets. Now, if I were to pick a point and freeze it and let n go right past it, then eventually that point will go to zero. But for no n, will all x be within epsilon of zero if I pick epsilon to be small enough? Therefore, this convergence is pointwise. We'll actually prove another way that it's pointwise. Let's consider what the integral is for each n. Well, hopefully we can see, if we remember that the integral is just area under a curve, this is just a triangle. The base is 1 over n. Sorry, that is the wrong height. 
should have been 2n. My apologies. So the base has a width of 1 over n. The height is 2 times n. So 1 half times base times height is 1. Therefore, the limit as n goes to infinity is the limit as n goes to infinity of the sequence 1. So of course that's just 1. And 1 is not equal to 0 in my expertise, but 0 is equal to the integral from 0 to 1 of the limit as n goes to infinity of fn of x dx. Because this for each x is 0 because we have a pointwise convergence. So of course the integral from 0 to 1 of 0 would be 0 which is not 1. So let that be a warning of the dangers of passing the limit under the integral when you do not have uniform convergence. So as a corollary to our last theorem, which was on the integral of the convergence of a sequence of functions, here we have a series of functions. If fn is a sequence of Riemann integrable functions and the series, that is the infinite sum, converges uniformly to f, then f is Riemann integrable and furthermore the integral is given by this formula. Let me give you a quick idea of how the proof of this follows directly from the result of the previous theorem. The fact that the series converges to f uniformly means that the partial sum converges to f uniformly. And because fn is Riemann integrable and the partial sum is a finite sum of Riemann integrable functions, Sn is Riemann integral Bo. Therefore, we can apply directly the previous theorem to get our result. So now let's consider differentiation and a sequence of functions. Suppose that fn is a sequence of differentiable functions and each derivative is continuous. Then if fn converges pointwise to f and the derivative sequence converges uniformly to g, then f is differentiable and the derivative of f is given by the limit of the sequence of derivatives, that is, g. So let's prove the result. Let x not be an arbitrary entry in the domain of the open interval a to b. Because fn is differentiable, the fundamental theorem of calculus implies that fn of x equals fn of x0 plus the integral from x0 to x 
fn prime of t dt. Right, so in fact, we used exactly this result uh, to prove the fundamental theorem of calculus. We proved the antiderivative exists by using explicitly this. Now, fn converges pointwise. That means for each x, f of x is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of fn of x. Right? For each fixed x, this is a sequence of numbers that converges to f at that x. Now we have an expression for fn of x, so this equals the limit as n goes to infinity of fn of x naught plus the limit as n goes to infinity of this integral. I can distribute the, sum, the limit across this sum. Now, am I allowed to pass this limit under the integral? Well, only if fn prime converges uniformly, and it does. And this, according to this term, is equal to f of x naught plus the integral from x naught to x, the limit as n goes to infinity of f n prime of t dt, which we know to be g. x naught to x, g of t dt. Therefore, f prime of x equals, of course the derivative of that, that's a constant, so that's d zero, and the derivative of this is g of x. And we've proven our result. Similar to the integral result, we can adapt our derivative result to series. If fn is a sequence of differentiable functions and each derivative is continuous, if the series fn converges pointwise to f and the series of derivatives converges uniformly to g, then f prime is g. In other words, if I have the derivative of an infinite sum, that's equal to the, sum, the infinite sum of derivatives, if these two conditions are met. We'll leave the proof as an exercise to the reader, as it's very similar to how we adapted the integration theorem for sequences of functions to series of functions. That's it for now.